My name is Amanda Heffernan and I'm a lecturer in leadership here in the Faculty of Education at Monash University. I'm also the course leader of our new Master of Educational Leadership. I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nations on whose traditional estates we meet today, to their ancestors and to the children who we are educating into the future. I also acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present. We are so pleased to welcome you tonight to the formal launch of our new course, the Master of Educational Leadership. It'll be followed by our public lecture that explores the contemporary challenges facing educational leadership. Now, while this isn't necessarily what we imagined the evening would look like, like all educators, we are very resourceful people and we were able to make this switch to this new way of doing things that we're all going to be getting used to for probably some time now. We'll start our public lecture in about 20 minutes, but first wanted to share some information about our new course and um, perform our official launch of the course. We'd like to thank you all for making the time to come tonight to be with us to hear about the work being done here at Monash for your interest in our new course, and it's one that we are extremely proud of. The next slide, please. Thanks, Chantelle. So the course looks at a big picture of educational leadership. We see educational leadership as not being fixed in a formal role, and we see education as being more than schooling. The course is relevant then to aspiring and practicing leaders and to anyone who does the work of educational leadership, regardless of their formal role. Education, in our view, takes a broad view of schooling, early childhood, VET, higher education. We even have some students in education-focused roles in business and not-for-profit organisations as well. We encourage people in this course to think differently, to act critically, and to respond creatively to address the challenges posed in a complex, diverse, and technologically rich world. I'll speak a little bit more about some of the specifics later on, but I wanted to start first with the core purpose of the course and some of the key takeaways. If we could move to the next slide, please. There are some key aspects here that we think are really vital for leaders today and into the future. Monash, as you know, is positioned as one of the world's leading education faculties. Monash challenges students and staff to change it. When they see where difference needs to be made, they can rise to those challenges. This course will help educational leaders develop or strengthen the knowledge, skills and confidence in their ability to do so. In this course, we examine how leadership interacts and responds to policy, politics and power. We examine wicked problems facing education and educational, and educational challenges. We examine the persistent problems with no simple solution and we challenge students to think differently and critically about how they can respond to those issues. We take a global view of education policy and education itself because we understand that what's happening on a global level influences each and every educational setting, which we're currently living through an incredibly stark reminder of, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that later this evening. Some of the different ways that we ask our students to think differently about educational leadership, you can see here on the screen. We really want people to be thinking about the next steps in education and being able to anticipate what's coming next. Sometimes, as we can see from the current situation, we can't always anticipate what happens next. In taking that on board, then, we ask people to be able to think critically and creatively about the world around them. Some of the units within our course focus on the areas you can see on the screen here, looking at global influences on education policy and what that means for practice at a local level. We look at education um, through uh, ideas around what evidence is, how we understand and know um, leadership theory and leadership practice. We focus on relationships and leading ethically. And we also really focus on this idea around doing leadership differently. This is a course for those of you who want to do something different, who want to lead towards a better future and who understand that if we keep doing the same things that we're doing, we're just going to get the same results. So we need to be able to think creatively and think differently about the work that we do in education. If we can move to the next slide, please. Some of the things that people focus on um, quite a lot when they're thinking about further study is what it actually is going to look like for them in practice. We have a range of flexible studying modes here at Monash and particularly for this course, which means you're able to study in multiple modes. Our units are offered um, in flexible mode, which means you can study fully online if needed. We've designed our units specifically with this in mind. Many of us worked and studied full-time ourselves. Many of us worked in remote locations and studied online. 
And we also recognise that you're all balancing a million other responsibilities alongside your decision to continue with further study. The approach that Monash takes then is a standout approach by letting you work in the ways that you need to work in. You're supported to work asynchronously and synchronously, so at the same time as others and independently of others to achieve your learning goals and to work through your course requirements. To the next slide, please, Chantel. We also really focused when we were developing this course on finding ways to personalise your learning. So understanding that all of you are different, you're all coming in with different goals, with different backgrounds and different experiences. The course is structured in a way that means there are multiple entry points depending on your experience and your background. One thing we're particularly proud of is the way that you can personalise your learning within this course. We have a number of core courses that you can build upon to choose the areas of most interest to you. This might be ethical leadership, leading learning organisations, understanding international education or leading educational improvement, just as some examples. Depending on your entry point also, you can take up a range of units from across the faculty to expand your studies and your thinking. You can find more information about the course map and the sorts of units that we offer within the course on our course website. To the next slide, please, Chantelle. So our course has a really explicit focus on equity and a critical approach to understanding the world around us, as well as our place within it as educational leaders. We are uniquely positioned within this course. The majority of our academics have actually been school leaders and our experience has helped us to shape a degree that responds to the particular needs and anticipates the next trends and issues for leaders in education in all sectors. I wanted to spend some time um, reflecting on some of the comments from our course team. So the following slides include some reflections from um, the course team members so that you can see the sorts of things that we're hoping people will achieve. I think you've heard enough from me now. So if we move to the next slide, thank you. You can hear from some of our lecturers as well. So Dr. Melanie Brooks says that, I hope students develop their skills, knowledge and dispositions in a way that positively influences issues of learning, teaching and equity in schools. Dr. Fiona Longmuir hopes that the course will expand the horizons of students to understand the possibilities and complexities of educational leadership in a changing world. Our next slide, please. Thank you. Dr. Vanessa Fernandez says students will grapple with the nuanced and deeper understandings of leadership found in educational organisations today. The course brings a richness of the breadth and depth of wicked problems and the influence of institutional leadership within them. And finally, Dr. George Varian is really, really timely in his comments and suggests that what the current crisis should make obvious is that educational leaders can also be faced with tough decisions in times of crisis. The course equips educational leaders with the tools they need to act responsibly and make decisions ethically in the face of complex issues. Educational leadership in this sense is about facing up to our moral obligations as well as our more pragmatic concerns. I mentioned earlier that we have a range of entry points into the course um, and they will depend on your background and your experience. Um, we'll have some time for questions and answers soon and I think some of those will probably relate to this, but you can see that depending on your entry point, um, the course could be either two years, one and a half years or one year. The um, academic requirements are laid out here. I won't read them all out to you, but you can also find this information on um, the Monash course website as well. Um, for those of you who are coming from um, different backgrounds, um, you can see that you come in at different points and have different requirements, which will then translate into credit or recognition of your prior experiences. If we could move to the next slide, please. Okay, so to round up my little portion of talking um, and to open up the floor for questions, we'll finish off just by talking about when applications are open. I'm currently open for semester two 2020 for those of you who are thinking about studying, remembering also that you can study fully online. Um, so it's a perfect time perhaps to, to pick up a book and start to, <laughs> to move to the next step in your learning journey. Um, those applications close on Friday the 26th of June and you can see those requirements here as well um, for what to include. If you head to our application page and our course page, there's heaps more information there to, um, to tell you what the requirements are as well as the processes for going ahead with that. And if we can move to the next slide, we now have some time set aside 
um, probably the next 10 minutes for some questions and answers about the course. We also have some of our admissions experts here as well to answer any questions that might come through. Amanda, I have a question here um, from someone asking whether they can switch between online and on-campus modes. Um, so my understanding is that you would be enrolled in flexible mode, which means that when you can come on campus, you're very welcome to join the on-campus sessions um, and otherwise you're able to study flexibly online at your own pace and in your own time. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, Amanda, can I add to that? Please do. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca. You're probably seeing me chatting on the comments in YouTube. Um, just wanted to add to that that uh, when you enrol, you'll be given the choice of enrolling uh, in on-campus mode or off-campus mode, and the off-campus mode is what we um, call flexible mode. Um, yeah. Um, I've got another question here um, in what what are some of the career outcomes that someone can expect after completing this course? That's a really great question. Um, so we see more and more around the world that formal leadership positions in education are um, requiring some kind of postgraduate study in, um, in the field. Um, so we think that this is a really fantastic degree for being able to prepare you for those positions. Um, we also would recommend it to anyone at a point in their career where they're thinking about leadership. So um, if they're looking at taking on, for example, in a school, perhaps a head of department role or a deputy or assistant principal role or a um, formal principal role, then um, it would be the perfect unit for that, as well as that, um, as I mentioned, all of the units have been developed to really have a broad focus that is inclusive of people who are taking on leadership roles in um, early childhood or vet or higher education as well. So there's a broad range of career possibilities, I suppose, for people. Um, there's also the opportunity if you are coming straight out of an um, undergraduate degree with those longer, um, the two-year course, that if, if leadership is something that you're thinking about, um, then it, this would certainly give you a taste of what leadership could be and what it means and, and how it might impact upon your future career choices. Um, Amanda, we do have another question. I'm just um, collecting a few um, questions from a few different sources. So I'm going to read out the next one, which is about a specific one about someone who doesn't have a degree, but does have 20 years of experience in education. Can they still get an offer? I would love to throw that one over to Rebecca. <laughs> So sorry, Chantel, could you repeat that? I was just responding to someone on YouTube. <laughs> no worries. Um, it's just someone that has a that doesn't have a degree, but has had 20 years experience in education. So they're wondering if they can still get an offer. Okay, great. So, um, so you wouldn't be eligible for entry directly into the master's degree program. Um, but we do have the potential of a pathway program um, which uh, could potentially give you the ability to move into the master's after completing a graduate certificate. Um, so our faculty offers a graduate certificate of education studies, um, which does have an option of being able to apply without having uh, any um, bachelor degree previously or any um, tertiary studies if you have significant relevant work experience um, and references um, that you can provide to demonstrate that. Um, so we can assess that on a case-by-case -case basis with our admissions team for entry into that graduate certificate and if you complete that graduate certificate successfully with a minimum 60% average grade 
um, then you can apply for the master's program. And you would likely also then be eligible for um, one of the shorter entry points um, as well, because you've done, you've completed a graduate certificate um, prior to commencing the master's. Hope that makes sense. Great, thanks for that, Beck. We've also got another, so we've got a few questions coming in fast. Um, so we've got another one about contact hours per week. Um, how many contact hours per week? And can they work full-time and study full-time at the same? Okay, I can answer the contact hours per week question. Um, each of our units is um, does have a set uh, recommended contact hours. Um, and that does vary in the way that that actually looks depending on whether you're studying online or um, coming face to face. Um, we ask that students commit to um, 36 of that 36 hours sorry across the semester of that active engagement, which does translate to around about three hours a week in terms of um, engaging directly with your um, the other people in your course and your lecturer. Um, that might be through the face-to-face -face, um, workshops or it might be through um, engagement in a range of online activities, which we um, do make sure that there's a variety of them um, and that there's lots of different opportunities and ways to kind of express your learning through, um, through that period. The um, majority of our students are studying while working full-time. Um, one of the things that I think is really worth acknowledging is that we started this, um, this course this semester and um, our students are balancing um, working in educational settings, whether that's schools or early childhood, we've got, you know, a range of people working in a range of different places and um, still managing to engage and the feedback is that the units are helping them to think really differently about the current challenges that they're facing every day in their schools. So um, I think it's really important to note that it is possible um, and that Monash is um, committed to supporting students to work um, through, a, you know, a variety of different ways. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I have a question from Joe online. Hi, Joe. Um, Joe is wondering if you uh, have any thoughts on what the current pathway for leaders looks like um, in terms of people within schools. Um, so obviously this course is gonna give some great skills, but I guess he's, um, looking to find out sort of what the career progression is like in terms of leadership through this uh, through schools and other areas of education sure okay that's a really interesting question and i guess it looks different in every um sector in every state and territory probably every country as well um there are different um pathways to leadership in primary schools for example than there are in secondary um, I was a, a teaching principal in a primary school um, very early in my career um, because you end up in a very small school where you're kind of the only adult <laughs> in, in the room and um, the, that's a really significant contrast to what happens in the secondary system where you will work your way up generally through being, um, you know, a year-level coordinator, a head of department, um, a part of the formal leadership team as perhaps a, a deputy or assistant principal and then into um, the principal position if that's what you're intending to do. So um, the, the, the difference is um, quite significant and we find that, um, well, the evidence tells us that uh, people who have been through some kind of formal leadership program or preparation program such as this one, um, do tend to stay in the role for longer because they're prepared, they have a really deep understanding of um, the context and the work of leaders. And so um, it's something that I did early in my career as a teacher was to continue my master's um, and found that to be obviously very useful because I'm sitting here as an academic who just can't stop studying. Um, but I think that that's something that's really key to think about is that the knowledge that you do gain in a um, a further degree does really equip you to be able to respond thoughtfully to um, the things that get thrown at you as an educational leader every day. It's a very long answer. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> 
Do we have time for one more, Amanda? I think we do, yes. Probably just one more, I'd say, looking at my watch. Yep, great. Um, I've just got one more question. Um, we've got, what is the online experience like? Um, do I log in at specific times, for example? And I think in this, in this environment, um, that's a, few, a question that a few people are asking at the moment. Okay, that's a really great question. So um, there's, we do have a range of different um, options depending on the unit, depending on the unit goals, depending on um, the sort of um, the ways that you're working with your particular lecturer. Um, personally, I find that in my experience in teaching online, students prefer to have a, a mixture. Um, we wouldn't have weekly online sessions, for example, like this. Um, we would have a mixture of some online stuff where we can um, connect in the same at the same time, and they would be quite informal, just opportunities to, to connect and talk about the ideas within the unit. Um, for the most part, um, the kind of adult learning principles around asynchronous education are really key. And we're noticing also as a lot of universities are pivoting to um, shifting things online at the moment, they're realising that students want and need to be able to work asynchronously, which means independently. So there's not an expectation that you'll turn up at a certain time um, uh, unless, um, you know, that's something that's built into the core structure for a reason for that unit. I think what we'll do now is we'll progress to the public panel session. So I'd like to welcome Professor Amanda Berry to open the session today for you. Thanks, Chantelle. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our public panel session tonight, focusing on contemporary challenges facing educational leadership. And if ever there was a time for contemporary challenges facing educational leadership, it's right now. My name is Amanda Berry and I am the Associate Dean of Research for the Faculty of Education at Monash and I'll be hosting tonight's panel session. Just as we get started, I'd like to pay my respects to the people of the Kulins Nation on whose traditional estates we meet today and to their ancestors and to the children who are educating into the future. I also acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present this evening. And unfortunately, we're not able to meet in person tonight, but we're really pleased that people were able to join with us electronically. And no doubt these are the kinds of technologies that we'll need to get more familiar with over the coming months. Uh, and um, in the background, you might be able to see our beautiful learning and teaching building. So if we were physically present, this is where we'd be. But thanks again for joining in um, electronically now. So when we first proposed the idea of a public panel session focusing on contemporary challenges facing education leaders, we never imagined that we would find ourselves in the midst of such an enormous challenge as we do now that calls upon the capacities and resources and imagination of our educational leaders. These are unprecedented times. It sounds like a cliche, but actually we're immersed in the situation right now as we grapple with all kinds of uncertainties, complexities, and worries of a rapidly changing world. All of us are trying to make sense of the current situation for ourselves, for our families, our workplaces, and our communities. And tonight you're going to hear from three inspiring speakers on the topic of these contemporary challenges. Professor Jane Wilkinson from the Faculty of Education at Monash University, Dr. Amanda Heffernan from the Faculty of Education at Monash, and also Mr. Andrew Pierpoint, who's the president of the Australian Secondary School Principals Association. So we thank those speakers very much for coming along, making it their time to contribute to this session. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll follow up with a Q&A session for a panelist, for all the panelists. And uh, as you listen to each speaker this evening, we encourage you to think about what questions you would like to ask either to individuals or to the whole panel, just generally. And you can put in your questions via uh, the YouTube link where you're watching now, and we'll collate those and then we can direct them to the panel afterwards. And just to let you know also that this session will be recorded and we'll send you a link for everybody who has um, registered so that you can come along. 
Before I introduce the first speaker, tonight is also a pretty exciting night for our um, research agenda for the Faculty of Education because it's the public launch of our agenda for 2020 to 2025 of which educational leadership is an identified priority and research strength. Thanks for the slide there. So you'll see um, here's five different areas that we have identified as important, both current strengths and emerging areas of strength and focus for the Faculty of Education, reimagining educational leadership, transforming teaching and learning, shaping digital futures, enhancing health and wellbeing, and educating for diversity and inclusion with a central connecting focus around fostering fair and sustainable futures. So the idea is that each of these priorities has its distinct identity, but each is also interconnected because as we recognise the kinds of societal issues and challenges that we face currently, these are complex and interdisciplinary and necessarily draw upon the collective capacities of our academic across a range of different areas. So now I'll briefly describe each of these areas, if we could have the next slide, please. So transforming teaching and learning. And if ever we're thinking about the transformation of teaching and learning, it's right now as our world is changing and the kinds of ways in which we need to adapt and change teaching and learning is evolving very rapidly. And some of the big questions, because how we frame these research priorities is around a focus area with big questions and ways in which we anticipate impact for this area. So we have, how do we conceptualize, build and support ways of thinking and learning for the future? What can educators do to support new kinds of learning and thinking with their students? What is the role of social networks and professional communities in educational reform? And how can we start to understand the nature of lifelong learning, for instance, as we're moving towards the different forms of engaging with learning? And what does that mean in terms of the sort of research and evidence we need to produce? Next slide, please. Well, shaping digital futures seems also very relevant uh, for our current times as well in terms of the rise of digital technologies transforming the world in which we live. So how do we use those digital technologies productively for education? And some of the questions here that we're grappling with include how can digital education be designed to improve learning and teaching? Now we're hearing a lot about schools transitioning onto line, but can it actually make a contribution in terms of learning and teaching? How does digital technology alter the nature of disadvantage in education? How does digital technology impact health, mental health and wellbeing? And what's the future of education in an age of automation, AI and big data? Such relevant questions for the times. And next slide, please. So enhancing health and well-being. Health and well-being obviously are critical for a flourishing society. So how can we learn about the role of um, health and well-being in education and supporting healthy communities as well as individuals? Some of the big questions that we're grappling with in this area include what are effective ways to engage at-risk groups and how do we connect them to health services? What are the most effective ways to address health inequities and social exclusion? And how can parents, educators and communities be best supported to engage in health and wellbeing? And next slide, please, um, Chantal. Um, educating for diversity and inclusion. We're thinking here about questions um, related to the ways in which education can embed in, and reduce inequality, sorry, in, further embed it or reduce inequality or inclusion. So how can we work more effectively to provide quality education and foster gender equality? How do we understand diversity and disadvantage and their impact on teaching and learning and living in society? How can educators improve the success of learners from diverse or disadvantaged backgrounds? And how and why are some learners excluded from accessing quality education? So finally, reimagining educational leadership, the focus of what we're here for tonight to listen to. And as I look at the text here, it seems particularly relevant again for the kind of situation we find ourselves in, living in a volatile world society becoming fragmented and inequality rising. So how can our research start to reimagine the role of educational leaders 
to better address these complex challenges. So some of the questions here that we're looking at is what does the work of educational leaders look like and what needs to change? What are the impacts of policy and politics? How can research redefine the role of educational leadership? And you can see there on your screen, we have three examples of current projects with the team in the Faculty of Education leading educational leadership in these areas. So creating more equitable schools, so looking at the ways in which we collaborate with industry and government to retain high quality principles across Australia, really vital. Amplifying voices, this is an international project looking at the intersection of religion and education in Thailand. And building a community of practice, we have researchers focusing on restorative justice and how it's used in Australian schools to build strong and respectful learning communities. So they're just three examples of the ways in which we're currently engaging educational leadership research. And now who are those people within our faculty who are doing the work? This is our research team, our very talented and capable research team, um, two of whom are here this evening I've introduced earlier, Professor Jane Wilkinson, who works in the area of educational leadership for social justice, with a particular focus on refugee education, and Amanda Heffernan that some of you might have heard talking earlier about the new master's course that we're introducing whose work focuses on the contemporary challenges of principles work. We also have Dr Fiona Longmuir looking at the intersection of educational leadership, educational change and student agency. And next slide, please. Dr George Varian, um, who's working in theology of education, educational leadership and social justice. Dr Melanie Brooks, who's looking at Islamic schooling and educational leadership in context of conflict. Dr. Nicholas Sum, who's working in the area of fully relevant and critically spiritual practice. And Dr. Vanessa Fernandez, who is looking at data informed decision making processes and how that facilitates those processes across different school systems. So these are the researchers that we're working with, and you've seen some examples of the project. And now let's actually launch into the panel time. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Jane Wilkinson. You just saw a tiny snapshot of the work that she's involved in now. And um, I'd like to welcome her uh, to begin this panel session. Thank you, Jane. Thanks very much, Mandy. I'm um, just reaching over and I'm going to just uh, move my, my um, screen a little bit. And I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, I've got a photograph uh, behind me of a, um, a young woman from a South Sudanese background and her name is Vicky and uh, she's given me permission to talk about this but Vicky um, was a wonderful uh, young woman growing up in Wagga and I did a lot of research with Vicky and uh, her family in the South Sudanese refugee background um, uh, community in Wagga in um, southern New South Wales. I'm mentioning Vicky and her photograph because um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is the capacity of educational leaders and educational leadership to make a difference in the lives of young people. And one of the things that we were really interested in, in understanding in a place like Wagga, which was a very monocultural, very white um, community, was how this new group of young people and families from, you know, who were discernibly different from the school communities and the communities of that area, how they were starting to assimilate and start to, um, to really kind of uh, build a life within that community of Wagga Wagga. And so we asked the students to take photographs of the people, the places and the networks where they were starting to feel successful, where they were starting to feel like they were had a sense of belonging and what was helping them to build that. And so it won't surprise you as educators that one of the really critical things that they came up with was the importance of school, the importance of um, early childhood for the younger brothers and sisters, the importance of adult education for their families and caregivers, and the importance of the relationship between themselves and those educators along with a whole lot of community groups, sporting coaches, um, church leaders, etc. I'm mentioning this particular project 
because I think the thing that it brought home really clearly to me is that as educational leaders, educating occurs everywhere. And we think about educational leadership as something maybe that's, you know, just confined to schools and principals. But if we think of it more broadly, it's yes, it's what goes on in schools, but it's also what goes on in the community, in the ways in which people come together to kind of help young people and children become a part of uh, the world in which we live. And I think we're seeing some really interesting examples of that happening at the moment with the COVID-19 and the spread of that disease and the ways in which, um, you know, communities are starting to practice some uh, practices of kindness, of caring and role modelling what these things can look like. So one of the things that we've been asked to do is to talk about um, how we might reimagine educational leadership and what, is, what are some of the contemporary challenges. I know for our principals, for our assistant principals and for our teachers in schools, for our early child, childhood workers, um, for our university lecturers, uh, for our people in vet, uh, in business, that there's an enormous challenge that we're currently facing around COVID-19 and how we deal with the kinds of stresses and anxieties and what that means in terms of educating um, the, you know, our young people. So there's a huge amount of strain and anxiety there. And I think, the, if nothing else, the, this current moment uh, for us, plus the bushfires that we've faced, plus the droughts that we have faced, have brought into sharp relief the difference that excellent leadership can make. Um, a Prime Minister who perhaps prevaricated too much during the bushfires, but is now starting to speak with a real authenticity a Premier who acted um, and is there each day for us, the health officials who stand up and speak calmly in the face of rising panic. And so we often think about leadership in these ways and we're right to do so because these are critical and really important role models for us. And one of the things that I'd say in terms of contemporary challenges and reimagining what educational leadership looks like is to think about leadership as being not only the person at the front, it's as many re researchers have noted, and I'm one of them, that leadership is actually a collective effort. And I think all of us who are educators would grasp that intuitively. It's a collective effort and it's a collective societal impulse. And how do you engender that as leaders to make that, that sort of collective effort really occur in a very proactive and positive way? So those virtual help groups that are springing up online, the acts of collective social kindness that we're witnessing every day, checking in on our elderly friends, on our neighbours, asking how our staff and our colleagues are. These are collective actions that can be modelled by the small actions and they grow quickly and they are crucial in the project of reimagining what educational leadership can look like and how it can be understood. So I guess the one message I'd ask you to take away from tonight from what I'm saying is that leadership, though the individuals matter, Though that person at the front is absolutely crucial, and I will never take away from that, I'd like you to start thinking about the collective nature of leadership, what that looks like, and how that can be engendered in really positive ways. And I think some of our most effective leaders um, do an excellent job in that. I'm going to finish because I think I've only got a couple of minutes left, but um, I'm going to talk about the project that I've been working on for the last two to three years with my colleagues here in the Faculty of Education at Monash University and also at Deakin University. I'm going to ask Chantelle and she's just done it wonderfully. Thank you, Chantelle. Um, so the research that we're working on at the moment is capturing the invisible work of school principals and assistant principals and of school leaders more broadly. And we were really interested and in wanting to understand the role of schools in building social cohesion. And I think we all have a sense that the society in which we currently live seems to be a lot more fragmented than the one that I certainly grew up in. And that there seems to be a lot more, and perhaps because of social media or for a whole range of reasons, a lot more division. And so the Victorian government about two years ago wanted researchers to put forward ideas for potential research that could be done around how we as a Victorian community can build a more socially cohesive society. 
And one of the things that I realised when I looked at the research was that there's actually not much research done around um, the actual job of schools in building social cohesion. But as an educator and someone who worked for many years in the schools, I know how critical, and as a parent, how critical schools are in actually helping to build a sense of community and belonging, or potentially sometimes, you know, kids feeling more fractured and, and really being at each other's throats. And I know how critical those leaders and educators are in, in helping to kind of acknowledge the sort of diversity that's there, but build from it in really positive ways so that people, young people feel a sense of belonging. So what we did, first of all, is we looked at the um, examples and practices of school leaders who are doing a really great job in working in their schools to build more socially cohesive societies. And we deliberately picked a range of different schools, primary and secondary or public schools, and they were nominated for, by a variety of different people within the department and through our own contacts. And we've written a quite extensive report about what that looks like and the sorts of practices those school leaders engaged in. And I'm very happy to um, send that information to people if, if you're interested. But the second thing we're doing now that some of you who are um, involved in leadership as assistant principals or as principals in the Victorian public system um, might be interested in is we're really wanting to understand what that sort of invisible work of building social cohesion looks like. And so we've got put together a short um, survey that we're asking um, principals and assistant principals to fill out and we're asking you to identify what you see as the key social issues that are facing um, uh, Victorian public schools and public school leaders at the moment. What are the things that are helping to support you to deal with those sorts of social issues? And what might be the resources that you need or the gaps that are currently existing? And we're gonna be using that as the basis to have conversations with the department and with the, um, the policy makers so that things can be put in place to support leaders in doing this really critical work. And we've got some um, groups such as the uh, Victorian Association of Primary and Secondary Principals on board uh, who have been an enormous support along with um, some philanthropic organisations that have funded this. So I encourage you to jump on that survey. I know that at the moment, people are probably thinking, you've got to be joking, Jane, there are far more important things than, than yet another survey. Um, and I agree with you. So no stress, don't worry if you haven't got the time. But if in a week's time you're sitting down with a glass of wine, putting your feet up and thinking, I've got one minute, just have a little think about it. But I, I'd, I'd love to hear your questions. I'm looking forward to our, our panel and our chat and I'm very happy to be contacted and follow up any more with reports and things like that. And I hope that we may see some of you in, in our course in the future. Thanks very much. Okay, I've got the unenviable task of following along behind Jane, <laughs> and I'm just going to share some reflections on um, some of the, I guess, contemporary challenges that are facing um, our school leaders in particular tonight. I think it's really difficult to talk about anything without first acknowledging that the world we're living in right now has completely flipped upside down. Our teachers, our leaders, and our other school workers have become frontline workers. Schools are considered essential now to the functioning of society. And apparently it's unthinkable that they might need to close due to the global pandemic. Although we are seeing this week that that can change rapidly. We do know also from other countries that what matters this week is going to feel irrelevant next week and into the coming months. Our school leaders are currently trying to balance keeping students safe, helping them to cope with the current situation, keeping vulnerable staff safe, interpreting an absolute avalanche of information, directives, policies, procedures, and also trying to cope themselves with a world that seems to change from moment to moment. Recent statistics put our principal workforce in Australia as one in five leaders being above the age of 60. This week, we saw a health advice release that people over 60 years of age should not be in schools right now. Many of our leaders and teachers have described feeling like sacrificial lambs, like they're viewed as dispensable, like their health and well-being is weighed up as insignificant in contrast to the economic factors that are driving so many policy decisions right now. They are frightened and they are angry. I have a real fear that the impact these decisions are going to have on our profession is incalculable. 
we already had evidence that principals are severely overworked. Data regarding their health and wellbeing is incredibly concerning. And we know that the job itself is taking a significant toll on people's physical and mental health even before all of this. At Monash, we conducted large scale research earlier this year that pointed to our education workforce, teachers in particular, feeling overworked, overwhelmed and underappreciated for their work. Every day now, I find myself wondering how this has changed. The long-term ramifications of these decisions are going to be impacting on our workforce in untold ways and for a long time to come. Our leaders are sitting as the conduit between politics, policy and practice on the ground. They are the people who are being pushed from all angles to be able to make the right decisions on an untold number of challenges every day in unprecedented times. I was a school principal in the Queensland floods of 2010 and 2011, and Andrew, who you'll hear from next, and I were recently reflecting on our experiences of leading schools during that time. Almost 10 years on, those experiences still felt as fresh as if they were yesterday. The weight of a school leader's role still weighs really, really heavily in a time of crisis. Before all this started, when we first started planning this event, I was going to talk about how the role of the principal has grown to be something that encompasses too much. It holds too much pressure for someone to be able to do while striking a balance in other areas of their life. It was then, and is even more so now, all-consuming. So as a researcher, I'm going to take it back to the data here. I'm starting from the premise that we know the current climate is incredibly stressful. It's challenging. It's all the other adjectives. We need to understand that teachers and leaders have come into this situation with many of them already feeling overworked, overwhelmed, and like they don't know how they could go on from here. In my experience and in my research, which examines attraction and retention of leaders in challenging contexts, I've had multiple participants report that they couldn't see themselves in the role of a school leader for an extended period of time because of the toll it's taking on them. We really need to understand the impact of the principalship on our school leaders. It's an impact that is most often being felt most significantly by people in challenging contexts, but evidence tells us that the role is significant and continues to grow for leaders regardless of their context. This is something we need to recognise and to talk about so that we can try to have some positive influence on the way we conceptualise the role, the way we find the right people to lead our schools, and the way we support and develop them so that they can remain in the profession. There's one story from a principal in my recent study that has really stuck with me. It highlighted the deeply personal impacts of leading schools today, particularly those schools that are challenged um, in different ways. They're deemed difficult to staff. They're more complex. They support populations of significantly vulnerable students. They're underfunded and so on. I'm going to call this principal Kathy for the purposes of this, and I just want to read you a little bit of a quote that she gave me. She said, I mean, it's just the fatigue factor the emotional factor. Probably you'd find this is similar in non-low non socioeconomic schools, but if I've gone home and I've had a really bad day and I've been abused, I either don't want to talk or see or do anything on a personal level with my husband. He'll often say, I want a hug, and I'll say, I just don't want to be touched. I'm not going to take this again because they come through the door at 100 miles an hour all day long, every day. And he says to me, we used to hug all the time and now you don't hug. My kids say to me, mum, you don't hug us anymore. And it's like, no, I don't because I just want my space now. That's what it does to you. That's your intimacy with your partner and your intimacy with your kids. One of my kids, they sent me an email and said, hi, mum, I don't see you at night. So I thought when they realised they could get me on the work email, they sent me an email just saying hello and checking in with you, making sure you're okay. So, yeah, that's what it's like. Kathy was not alone. Other principals in the study spoke about the impact of their work resulting in relationship breakdowns, in their inability to be at milestones for their own children, about the fact that when they were at breaking point, the first thing to go from their routines and to-do lists was their own self-care. Mountains of never-ending emails took the place of exercise classes. Once leisurely Sundays were being spent doing the administrative work that just couldn't be done during school hours. Holidays were spent more often than not recovering from the illnesses that would strike during the first week once they'd finally slow down. We have a responsibility to look after and support the people working in our schools. For those who might need an economic argument or imperative, we also have that. The cost of principal turnover is significant. 
not only in the actual physical recruitment and development of leaders, but also because higher rates of principal turnover correlate with higher rates of teacher turnover. The importance of the school leader is also seen in the effects turnover has on student achievement, community engagement and staff morale. Our research that I mentioned earlier warned of an imminent crisis in the retention of teachers. Over half of the teachers in our study indicated that they would leave education if they could. The principals in my current research don't want to leave, but many of them are struggling to see a future where they can maintain a career in the principalship long term, in light of the current pace and complexity of the role. They continue to return to their jobs every day because, in their words, they do it for the kids. Their moral purpose, the thing that sustains them, is the sense that they're making a difference for their school communities. I've been working with a colleague, Martin Mills, from the University College London Institute of Education, and we've been exploring the social justice implications for leaders in those difficult staff schools. We found that leaders in vulnerable communities or marginalised communities have taken on those roles through a sense of solidarity and moral duty. They have a deep and profound sense of responsibility, commitment and emotional engagement with their students, staff and wider communities. It helps us to understand why people keep going back to a job. There's a sense of justice for them, of contributing to a greater good. So you can see it's not all doom and gloom. And there are other ways forward. We can reimagine the principalship in ways that are more sustainable, that enable practices that are based on a shared understanding of the purpose of schooling, that pair away all the things that take leaders' focus away from their core purpose, which is, in the words of one of the participants in my study, to give young people the gift of education. It will take a rethink of how we structure schools what we expect from schools, how we interact with schools, how we trust our leaders and how we express that trust. But the thing is that we're in a moment now where that reimagining is already necessary. We need to think and listen to our leaders and our education experts in the coming months and years as we readjust to a new way of doing things and to a new world. What is vital is that we do not forget, not for a minute, that the importance of schools is undeniable. Teachers and leaders are being repositioned as frontline workers and we do not let anyone else forget this either. Our work as academics was described to me by one participant as intellectual whistleblowing. They aren't able to speak publicly about these issues, but we can and we must. Someone who is absolutely tireless in his advocacy for the profession is our next speaker, Andrew Pierpoint. Andrew is the president of the Australian Secondary Principals Association and he represents thousands of principals around the country in his work. We are so privileged to have him joining us tonight and really, really grateful that he's made the time to speak on these issues. And I'm going to hand over now to Andrew. Thanks, Amanda. Good evening, everyone. I have the incredibly unenviable job of following Jane and Amanda. I've got a few uh, bits of uh, notes scribbled down on a bit of paper here, not... Uh, not like Amanda's very uh, articulate presentation. Um, I've been a teacher for 36 years. I've been a principal for 20. And I always include, that I always say that I'm a teacher first because as a principal, I teach. I teach my deputy principals. I teach uh, other people in the community how to be a, a good teacher. Um, sadly, uh, Amanda, there are Cathy's, there are thousands of Cathy's all over Australia. Um, and we can share, share stories all, all evening. My role as president of the Australian Secondary Principals Association is I represent about four and a half thousand, five thousand school leaders from around the country to the federal government. That role is an advocacy role. It's not uh, an industrial role that's left very capably to the um, AEU and the various jurisdictional uh, union bodies that we have in Australia. Our role is about advising government about policy where policy is falling down, where there should be a policy, where there's no policy. And obviously uh, of late, uh, bushfire response and COVID-19 response are, uh, are two very topical matters. I was asked to, to give three or four of the top issues that face uh, principals um, every day, in every school, in every way. Um, so uh, that, that, that is, uh, when I responded to Amanda, very, very simple. The first, the first issue I'd like to just raise is something that Jane and Amanda have, uh, have mentioned, and that's just the sheer volume of work that our school leaders are asked to do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Simply, um, the, the, the normal work day, let's say that's eight till five, 
um, doesn't take into account um, most of the administration tasks. Most of those administration tasks are done before eight or after five, with eight till five being dedicated to staff and, and student challenges. Phil Riley um, has done the longitudinal study for the last eight or nine years. Um, and that provides a very good reference point for, for this. Um, each year, um, Riley points out that the volume of work has increased from the previous year. Um, and each year um, in his first recommendation, he asks for governments to have the intestinal fortitude, my words, to be able to change the role of the principal. Um, and that, that is just unwearingly, <clears throat> me un unwearingly needed. ASPA has uh, had a research project with Monash University around principal autonomy. And that would be the second great stressor that principals face. Now, over the years, um, ASPA and various principal associations have called for greater principal autonomy, but we need that system to go with us, the education system to go with us. Uh, principal autonomy um, for experienced principals um, is a great thing. Tell me what the end result that you need from a government point of view is and give me the resources and I will take my community there following this path as opposed to another principal down the road with a different school, a different community chooses another path to get to the same end point. We spoke, Jane spoke about wicked problems and I think this is a wicked problem that we do have. It is exacerbated by rural and remote um, principals who tend to be our most inexperienced principals. They tend to be where the learning, the apprenticeship of leadership is done. And they do it quite often uh, in very, very challenging and in very, very difficult communities. Amanda uh, mentioned her time as a primary principal in a rural and remote uh, school. Um, I too have done uh, a lot of school leadership work in rural and remote schools and in, and in Indigenous communities. And some of those things are very, very tough and are very, very unique. And the Riley report also um, last year, so last year's report was based on the year before's data, actually for the first time called out principal autonomy as being one of the great stressors uh, for principals. I think there's a great deal of work that needs to be done by our systems around principal autonomy, if not in the first instance, working out what they mean by principal autonomy. It's not, for example, saying, just get on with it. Um, you know, here's some money, here are some resources, we'll throw some money at it and that'll solve the problem. It is far, far, far from that. I often talk about the black box um, of, of autonomy where the principal puts his or her hand into the box and pulls out the next challenge that they would like to take on for the school that they see in their strategic planning. The problem with the black box of autonomy, of course, is that the principal doesn't have any input into what goes into the box in which that they can, uh, they can draw out of. So that remains um, a great challenge. Another, uh, the third challenge that we, we certainly have that's a great stressor for principals and is no more so than the last couple of weeks given the crazy world that we live in nowadays is the community and parental expectations. Now having expectations, there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. It's very, very important to keep everyone focused on their job. However, fueled by misinformed and errant data use by um, various agencies like my school and various parts of the media around the use of just be very specific use of NAPLAN data, places a great deal of, of emphasis back onto the school. In my 36 years, I've never been asked by a parent at enrolment, um, how does your school go as far as NAPLAN is concerned? Never. And many of my colleagues have never been asked that as well. What they do get asked are the, the affective things. What do you do about bullying at this school? What do you do about mental illness at this school? They're the types of things that parents, I think, humbly, really would like to know. Not how NAPLAN goes or, or those other types of standardized, te standardized tests that you all know and I won't rattle off. The, the other uh, matter 
which is sort of uh, like an onion, it, it sits all around these, is just the, the, the well-being of our school leaders. The subtly, that, that well-being has got some subtleties to it where it's about attraction, it's about retention, and it's about the sustainability of people in those school leader positions. Many times um, our, our colleagues, my colleagues have heard that a, a deputy principal, for example, would say, why would, I, why would I take on your job for the small amount of pay that, that that gets me additionally in a fortnight's time? And that's very, very difficult to, to argue against unless you go to the moral uh, component of it, which was alluded to by both Jane and Amanda. The, the fourth one, um, the, the, the fourth or the fifth one that, that I'd just like to mention, um, which I think is, I didn't have written down, but I've, I've thought about this as Jane did her, um, her presentation. I call it the paradox of education. And principals feel this every minute of every day in their office and just walking around the school. And that is trying to balance up the performance of the school, the performance of their, of their principalship versus the moral per, moral dimension of their principalship and the moral purpose of the school. That is a, a bit of a push me, pull you type of thing of which there is a very, very fine lined answer, but a very, very restricted um, answer in that, in that area. They're the things I think that weigh very heavily um, on principals day to day. I could talk about this and, and increase the size of my soapbox um, significantly but I'll, I'll pull it up there, um, uh, Amanda, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you to all of our speakers. Each one of you um, complimented the previous one on following and you know the excellence of that speaker. And I'd like to say overall, I think you've done a magnificent job. And what you've done is bring very powerfully to life through those kinds of personal experiences, as well as the research challenges as well as the collaborative work that you're doing with other people to think about what are those challenges in terms of educational leadership and what are the ways in which we're starting to unpack, explore and try to manage some of those situations because not everyone that we um, face is solvable. And so now we come to the part of our session, which will be an interesting um, challenge of a panel. Uh, and our panel um, is here now. They're the three speakers that you've just heard do such a fantastic job, Jane, Amanda and Andrew, who are ready to answer the questions that you might have or the comments or issues that you would like to raise with this group of experts um, while they're here with us. Um, and just while we're gathering up those questions, uh, I'd like to start by asking the panel a question. It could be um, any one of you. And that is, well, actually, Jane started talking about belonging to begin with and some of the issues that we might be starting to experience now because the, the um, vocabulary around is around social distancing. So how do we start to build belonging in a world of social distancing and what are you what advice might you have to educational leaders to be able to support those feelings of belonging and maybe jane if i could invite you to speak first since it was belonging that you talk about are you talking specifically in relation to COVID 19 or just more broadly mandy oh well um at least to begin with, in terms of COVID-19, I'm just very aware of that language of social distancing as being quite the opposite of belonging. And so, you know, what are the sorts of things that we can do? You started to talk a little bit about that, um, but it, it could be good just to go back and um, think through that with us a little bit further. I heard someone the other day talk about rather than social distancing, they said use the, use the language of physical distancing but social interconnecting. And I thought that's that's great. That's maybe even just reframing it in that way. But I'm actually going to throw it over to Andrew because I think Andrew, I'm happy to answer, but I'd like to hear Andrew's thoughts as someone who's in touch every day with principals and has that strong principal background as well. And then, of course, Andrew and I can also respond. Thanks very much, Jane. I was going to say, like she said. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of schools these days take a great deal of pride in having believe as part of their mantra. 
and belonging as part of their mantra. In fact, uh, my previous school had belong, believe, achieve as its motto. Um, that we worked but uh, quite, quite funnily enough, we worked very, very hard for a very, very long time, time to come up with those three words. Um, I think a lot of schools now don't, sorry, I'll start again. A lot of schools now are challenged by the, the social platforms and what they can bring in a negative way to, to learning and to the culture of the school. And I'm thinking you all know what I'm talking about there, but here's a great opportunity for people to be physically removed from each other, but mentally or psychologically still very close to each other by the appropriate use of, of those uh, social platforms. I know many schools around the nation, not necessarily clustered anywhere in particular, just around the nation are utilizing that to an extreme amount to um, keep staff together, keep students together. And the, the matter about staff and students is, is a bit of a vexed issue because there's sometimes a code of conduct um, and whatnot, but certainly to keep the school community together is very, very important. I received uh, an email today, just like I did yesterday, just like I did the day before, and two text messages from my grandchild, my grandchildren's um, primary school. Why? Well, they, they don't really talk about anything that important, but it's about keeping base and touching base with the school. So I think that that provides a great deal of mm. opportunity. Mm. And just so we, how we start to build those communities of connection become really important. And uh, I take your point, all those ways in which we can care for each other become really, really important um, as well as thinking about the difference, different, as you said, Jane, between physical distancing and social connection. Um, I know that there's some um, questions from our online um, streamers. So I'll just ask either Rebecca or Chantelle, uh, would you like to read those out, please? Thanks, Mandy. Uh, great panel so far. Looking forward to seeing how everyone responds to further questions. Um, we have Luke Manal online from Indonesia. Um, and uh, Luke Manal, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, by the way, uh, was really relating to things that Amanda was saying in her talk um, and saying that he's, uh, he's been uh, leading a private school in Indonesia for the past nine months and can really relate to the, um, the talk about stress. Um, and he's wondering if there are any kind of resources or models that can address how principals cope with that kind of stress. Um, he knows the content, the context may be different from how things work in Indonesia across to Australia, um, but it would be great if, if he can get some examples of models that are working in other settings. So maybe he can help apply them to his situation and the, the stressors that he's experiencing. Sure. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a really good question. And it's kind of that question of, so what? So, you know, we do all this research and um, what does it actually mean for people in schools? Um, so, you know, we understand that people are feeling this way and how can we support them or help them to find ways to be supported? In Australia, certainly, we're seeing a lot of investments in um, from departments and from the government in principal well-being and school leader well-being. Um, there's associations like Headspace, for those of you who might be um, from Australia or working in Australian schools that could access that sort of thing, um, which are for more kind of um, support and counselling opportunities that I know Andrew works really closely with as well. Um, one of the key things, I think, that comes through from... Um, the research that we're doing is that the biggest source of support for principals is other principals. It's their networks. It's the people that they work with um, who are in the same kind of position, who understand them. Those principals who have really strong leadership teams or leadership structures within their schools are also coping more um, than people who are kind of doing it alone. So as an example of the power of those networks and how long lasting they can be, um, Andrew and I haven't spoken about this yet, but he and I worked together a very long time ago <laughs> and um, those relationships, you know, that relationship that we built together um, has continued obviously until today when we're in completely different roles um, but still finding ways to work together and to, to support each other in the work that we're doing. So I think the advice that I would give, um, as much as my advice might not mean anything, is um, to find people that you trust 
um, that you can talk to, that you can debrief with. Um, for example, there's principals in my current study who have a standing date that they call each other in the car on the way home every day just to check in and debrief so that when they get home, they've done that work and they're in a fresher headspace and they can kind of um, focus on themselves and their family or their friends or whatever. So there's little kind of habits that you can get into that um, can support you. But like all the research that we did with teachers earlier this year, a lot of it has to be around systemic change and structures and removing that workload and pressure from people. Um, Andrew, I'd love to hear if you had anything to add from your perspective on the ground. Yeah, yeah I, I agree totally with what you said. It's a really good question. The, the challenge that we have, of course, is exactly what, what Amanda has said. However, that would be step two in, in the solution. Step one is, of course, solving the problem. So you don't have to have the head spaces of the world um, and, and, and other organisations working with principals to give them a crutch to, uh, to prop them up. In the independent school, of which our questioner comes from, um, I think a very difficult question, very difficult conversation maybe with the board of, of that school about how much work the board is asking um, the, the principal to do and without knowing the the context of independent schools in the country in which uh, you come from that that makes it a bit difficult that's what i mentioned in my first bit there with in australian government schools um phil riley um makes a makes a point and he's made a point for many years now that we need the government to who who run who run the government schools obviously to, to have the intestinal fortitude to change the role of the principal. Because we're, we're working, I think, in about 19, yeah, more, more, circa 1963, and we're asking principals to work in 2020, 2021. And, and, and there's just a mis, mismatch there. Um, the other part about it is the delegations. What must the principal do and what can't the principal do um, is also a very, very important point. But I'll just leave it there, Amanda. Thanks. And Chantal, I think you have some questions there. Yeah, we do have quite a few coming through from some different sources. Um, we've got one that asks about what advice would you give educational leaders who are facing stressed parents and children in the COVID-19 panic? So probably um, an extension of your first question, Mandy. I think um, it's a... It's a topic that's on everyone's mind. Thanks, we'll just throw it open to anyone in the panel who'd like to address that question. I'd love to hear from Andrew, you're dealing with this every day. Well, I am, but I'm also dealing with a Headspace text message that just come in about a prime ministerial uh, conference um, that's gonna happen at eight o'clock. So can I just repeat the question again, sorry? <laughs> Not a problem, Andrew. Um, the question was that what advice would you give educational leaders who are facing stress parents and children in the COVID-19 panic? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. And, of course, it's real and it's happening today and it'll probably happen tomorrow for a few more months. My, my advice um, is, and, and this is about um, after talking with many principals over the last, you know, two weeks, is is to be out and about modeling that good behavior role modeling that everything's okay everything's under control i am in charge uh, in staff rooms and in the yard and with the community at the gate because the, as the principal goes their behavior is modeled um, by staff and their behavior is modeled to students so um my view, our view is to be a real leader, to stand up, to um, model those good behaviours around calmness and getting it together, putting out clear and concise uh, communication as best as you can, because that depends on what information you're getting in. Um, that, that, that would seem to be the best advice that we're giving our principals at the moment. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. And, um, Jane or Amanda, would you like to comment on the back of that? I think I've talked enough. Jane, did you want to have a <laughs> go? I, I, I think Andrew's put it in a nutshell. You're a role model 
and uh, you know you carry that authority as a leader, whether it's whether it's in a school uh, or in a university, which is currently what you know Amanda and I are dealing with, um, or in an early childhood setting or a vet. Um, they people look at you, staff look at you, and students will look at you, and they will take take their cues from you and from your behaviour. So um, you know how you behave. Uh, the, the calmness with which you behave and the reassurance, I think, is critical. It doesn't mean papering over what's going on. You know, you, mm. can, you can be forthright, you can be direct, but you also need to balance that with, uh, um, you know, that, that kind of, um, I guess, a, a warmth and a reassurance that it's, you know, put this in perspective, um, you know, keeping up to date with the stuff uh, that's that's going on, I think is really tough, but there are some really good information um, sources coming out through the ABC, for example, COVID-19 um, update each day. You know, th those sorts of things are really handy and, and making use of, I think, the, you know, the, um, the resources that are available, for example, through the Department of Education and, and other resources that, that have actually good factual basis. I think that's really critical as well. Mm, thanks, Jane. It goes back to the point that Andrew made earlier about guarding against data misuse as well. And I'd also like to connect to what you said earlier about it's not just those with people who have official designations as educational leaders. Face at the moment, we're talking about irrelevant to anyone who's in front of um, young people. So thank you for that. And Rebecca, I think you have a question for the panel. Is that right? Yes, sorry, um, Mandy, um, okay. just unmuting myself. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Um, we've had some some comments uh, on YouTube um, and Joe has mentioned um, things that, that have already been talked about. Um, the challenges faced by educators are unprecedented at the moment. Um, you know, obviously we have people at risk of infection um, and at times ill-equipped to, to deal with the issues that are presented with them. Um, and something I think that Andrew already addressed a little bit in, in the answer to a previous question, um, it's very important to, to look after the school community and, um, and children and parents in this situation, but to what extent is that um, a leader's role? Um, just wondering if anyone had any further thoughts on that, I guess, on the on the role of, of school leaders um, and educational leaders in these times. Do you want me to have a crack at this? Um, okay, I go ahead. The, the language we use these days, it, it is absolutely in the principal's wheelhouse um, to work with the community. Um, and the more rural and remote that you become, the greater that challenge um, increases. Uh, for example, if you are in a small community, um, our primary, our primary principals often are often faced with with the fact that they've got single digit or low double digit number of students at school. They can do, you know, thirteen parent teacher interviews as they go and get a loaf of bread on, on Saturday morning. That is critically important. Not about what they say about little Bill or Mary but critically important showing that they are a human being as they go down the road um, in their pair of stubbies and a, uh, and, and a polo shirt, as opposed to um, what they wear to school Monday to Friday, shows a great deal about how they respect that, that community, what they feel about that community. Parents are very, very quick and accurate to judge in my 36 years of, of uh, of leadership and authentic leadership is very, very quickly snuck, uh, sniffed out, or lack of it. Amanda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add there um, is kind of building on that for people who haven't had that experience of being a leader in a, you know, a rural community or a remote community, I know Jane, Andrew and I all have, um, the you live in a fishbowl a lot of the time and you are always accessible to people. You are always part of that community. Um, so, you know, when I mentioned earlier about um, being a principal in the, when the Queensland floods were happening, that 
the thing that I suppose the community um, sometimes forgets is that all of that stuff's happening to you as well. Um, and there's that real balance that Andrew spoke about before of you're the, you know, you're the calm face of the school, but inside you're like the duck paddling under the water of you're worried about your own health. You know, you look after your elderly parents. What if you take something from a school and give it to them? There's all of that sort of stuff that, that adds up that really does add pressure to um, principals. And I think the thing at the moment just, the first thing we have to do is be kind to ourselves because everyone is just under such pressure and such a, it's such a confusing time and things are like we have a, there's a press conference in two minutes that says what the next thing's going to happen to school. So things are changing so, so fast that you can't anticipate what's going to come next. You have to work, you know, consistently to have those good relationships with your community so that you can weather those tough times, I think, together. Mm. And that notion of sustainability that you talked about earlier, Amanda, I think is really relevant to Colin here as well. So given that we are um, moving towards the end and that there are other things that um, people want to be able to pay attention to, let's just go for two more questions to, that we have um, to finish up with. And, Beck, if you could let us know what your question is, please, from the online um, streamer. Sure, Mandy, thank you. Um, so we have Hannah online. Um, and um, Hannah was earlier mentioning um, she's concerned about practicing social distancing in preschool settings, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. Um, so, but she just wanted to ask, um, she's interested to know your thoughts on how, or the panel's thoughts on how social distancing will have an impact on leaders, so specifically, because I know we've, we've, you know, you've just been talking about community and connection um just wondering your thoughts on on how this can sort of translate when um we've got social distancing measures in place um and working with the community and working with parents and children thanks thanks Beck. Yeah. You, i'm happy to i can jump in first i think jane's um point earlier around rethinking what um, social distancing is and thinking about that in terms of physical distancing we can connect with people in other ways and obviously when you have very young children um, who are by nature a little bit germy and, and love to you know grab onto your arm as you walk past it, it's really really difficult to be able to do that um, but I think there's no need for communities to sort of Fall, school communities to fall away um, in the current time. We have so many other opportunities and the ways that we can connect with people and keep connected um, that it's it might just take a little bit of reframing or rethinking the way that we um, think about what community looks like in a school. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Andrew or Jane, would you like to make a comment in relation to that question? I was just say Mandy that um, I, th I think it's a great question and it's so crucial there are so many different ways to do it but um, I just think the fact that you know just just to check in to show you care makes such a difference it doesn't have to be a big thing um, but you know it might be an email it might be a text message it just might be a how are you when you you know the parent comes to pick up the the child at the end of the day from the daycare centre you know, just, just, and you don't have to be the one that all, always does it. You know, there's great people who work with you and, and, but also checking in with one another. Like, I think these things only happen if, you know, we're modelling it right through the organisation. So are we looking after one another? Are we doing a little checking, whether it's a by text or a WhatsApp or, you know, these sorts of things so that we can at least, you know, the difference it makes just to have a message from someone that just says, how are you going? Just thinking of you. It's just enormous. So that they might seem like little things, but they're actually, <clears throat> they really say a lot. They're very powerful. Mm. Andrew mentioned some of those points before too about that, that checking even when it doesn't feel like something super urgent or special. It's that matter of acknowledging somebody and um, connecting with them. Yeah. So um, I'll just ask one last question here because a lot of what we've talked about tonight is immersion in the current situation and the current kinds of demands um, and needs and concerns that people have. But what about as educational leaders looking towards the future? We're not going to be in this COVID-19 situation forever. So what is some advice that you have for educational leaders to help 
them to help others look forward to the future and uh, ways in which we can support the community not to only dwell in the present. I'm open to anybody making no, uh, comments around that. I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, just uh, one thing. Something that, that concerns me and uh, ASPA very significantly is that you, you don't find the AMA, the Australian Medical Association, being told how to perform appendectomies. You don't find the Royal College of Engineers being told how to build a bridge, for example. But you always are finding in, in press, I would almost say daily, by some expert um, telling us how to run our schools. Um, I think what principals need is some breathing space. Principals need the opportunity to lead their way, not lead another person's way through their eyes and through their hands and through their mind. I think that is critical of critical importance. And it goes to the heart of principal autonomy that I mentioned before. You, you need to lead like you do. You don't need to lead like someone else wants you to. That, that is an impossibility. You might be able to pull it off um, up until morning tea, but after morning tea, people will soon smell that you aren't being authentic, you aren't being genuine, you're doing someone else's bidding and you've lost the whole, the whole game. So um, I, I just leave it at that. That, that. that is one of the big things that I'd like to leave tonight. Thanks, Andrew. That's very powerful. Amanda or Jane, any messages around future focused ways um, educational leaders can work? Yeah, I, I'll let Jane go last so that she can have the final say. <laughs> um, I think the thing that I think this, among a million other things, is showing us is that things can be done differently. We're seeing that in every aspect of society right now, um, that, the, the you know, the way we did things had to change and then it could change as a result. So I think there's a real um, possibility for schools when things eventually return to normal to plan around what schooling is about, how we do schooling, um, you know, what is important to us and, and the fact that, I think everyone's going to see how difficult it is to uh, <laughs> to educate children when they're having to do that themselves at home. And so the expertise of educators, I think, is potentially um, in a position to be celebrated and respected um, in into the future. So I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that we'll be able to kind of reclaim a little bit of education from those, you know, the political footballness of it all um, when this is all over. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amanda. Nice point. And Jane? Um, the key word for me is trust. I, I've been dismayed, utterly dismayed as an educator to see the way in which uh, the media, politicians and policymakers have, um, I think, uh, led a campaign of complete mistrust. I'm talking in Australia. It's not the case in Finland and I work a lot with Finnish educators and researchers and I think that they have done education and, and young people and adult education and the whole gamut, a huge disservice. I think it's a high irony that at this time of crisis, we're told that the frontline workers, not just the healthcare workers, but they're also the educators. They're the preschool people. They're the academics. They're the school teachers who are turning up every day in front of the classrooms physically and being asked to put themselves on the line because at the basis of our society, we understand how important educating and educators are. So I would ask our policymakers and all of us to remember this when it's all over, that, you know, when the, when the, the kind of... Thank you. Thank you again.